So at this talk, I'm mostly going to focus on page size, runtime performance, and then also a little bit of how you can make your tests faster, which will make you more, more, more productive as well as your team. So let's start off with reducing your page size. So as you all know, one of the biggest features of the Angular ecosystem is the amount of tooling that we have at our disposal. And one of those tools is the Angular Build Optimizer. So if you're using Webpack and you're rolling your own Webpack uh, config, you might not have included the, the Build Optimizer. But if you're using uh, the CLI, it's already backed in for you. And what the Build Optimizer does is that it applies some Angular-specific transformations to your code that makes it easier to tree shake. Rem it removes some craft that you don't really need. And all you need to do to take advantage of it is to uh, include the Purify plugin, and then you also need to include the proper Webpack loader. And again, this is part of a uh, COI production build, but if you ejected your COI config at some point, then you might have missed it. Uh, then next up, we have an easy one, and it is to strip away white space when you do AOT compilation. And all you have to do to take advantage of it is to go to your TS config, and in the Angular compiler op options, you just say preserve white spaces equals false. Right now, it's true by default. In Angular 6.0, it's going to be false by default. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, then another thing that's really useful if you want to reduce your page size is knowing what your code transpires to. Because since we live in an ES5 world, it's uh, sometimes we kind of forget that like something super short and simple in TypeScript ends up transpiling into a lot of code. So I, uh, my first example is getters and setters. So on the left, I've got this custom input component. And this is a very standard getter and setter. So for example, it has this private disabled state. And then it has a getter that checks is input disabled, otherwise check if the parent is disabled. But on the right, you can see what TypeScript transpiles it to. And you can see there's a bunch of ES5 boilerplate that it has to define. And you can imagine that over a huge project, if you put gears and sales all over the place, it's going to really balloon your page size. So what you can do instead is instead of having a getter, you could have a function, which is more or less half the size of, of the getter. But of course, this doesn't mean that you should stop using getters and setters altogether. But it's something that you should consider when determining where, when, when writing your API, if it's not supposed to be convenient. So for example, if it's just a private method, then you might benefit from this. Then another such example is passes. You should try to avoid them sometimes. <laughs> so what this means is that if you have some data that you're passing around, but it doesn't really do anything, you might benefit from using an interface instead of a class. So for example, on the left, I have something that we used to have on Angular Material, which is a change event that gets dispatched by the material select. And it just has a source and a value. So all, everything that the class does is just store these values and pass them along. But you can see that when it's compiled, TypeScript adds all this extra boilerplate around it, which, again, can balloon your page size. So what you can do instead in cases like this one is that you can use an interface, which gives, provides you with the same type safety, but it doesn't add any runtime code. Again, this is up to you to decide when to actually use it. And for example, if this, if, whoops, if this event, <laughs> if this event had something like prevent default, then of course you can't do that on an interface anymore. But if it, if you're just passing around data, then it should be fine. Then the third example is async await, which is something that a lot of us are probably excited about. But at the state of things right now, it ends up transpiling into a lot of code. So on the left, I have something that's a pretty standard use case. We fetch some things from an API endpoint. We await them, and then we map their names to something. But what it ends up transpiling to is two nested functions, then a switch, then a switch statement, then a bunch of arrays which you can imagine that if you have a bunch of async awaits or a place, it's going to become huge. And also, this doesn't even include the TSLib, which defines these awaiters and generators and all that. So for some of these super simple use cases where you don't really get anything out of async await, you should consider just using plain old promises, which you can see transpile more or less to the same. Again, this is up to you to decide. If you have some 
really complicated method. Of course, it makes sense to use async await, but for these super simple cases, it doesn't really make sense. Then next up, we have runtime performance. So when it comes to Angular runtime performance, it's always useful to know the internals of Angular. So for example, some of you might, may have heard the term zones or ng zones. So what they do is that they patch into the native APIs so Angular can know when to run change detection. However, if you have some native API that runs really often, it means that you're also going to run change detection really often. So here I've got an example of a sticky header. So, for, so this sticky header defines an event listener on the, on the window that's going to fire for every pixel you scroll. And then once you're, when you're scrolling, it's also going to animate using a request animation frame. But what happens under the hood is that for every pixel that you've scrolled, you've, you're going to fire change detection. Then once you start animating, for every frame, you're going to trigger change detection. And you can imagine that this can slow things down a lot. So what you can do to avoid it is instead of binding through Angular's binding mechanisms, you can bind the event yourself. And you have to wrap it in, in this run outside Angular call. So you just inject the ng zone, and then you wrap it. And this ensures that you're not going to trigger change detection. And the same goes for animations. Whenever you start your animation, you should run it outside the zone. Uh, oh, yeah. And one thing to keep in mind is that when you run it outside Angular, Angular can't know that it should update the view. So at some point, you might have to re-enter the zone. But you should be smart about when you do it. So here are some examples of things that they are running into Angu in the Angular zone. So some of them are super obvious. So for example, set time, outside interval, add event listener, those kind of make sense. But then there's request animation frame. There's mutation observers. There's even things like the canvas when it outputs to a blob, or even the geolocation API. So it patches into more or less everything. So how do you know when to escape the ng zone? If you don't want to remember a list that has something like 100 APIs, what you can do is that you can import the ng zone class again. And it has these static methods on it that tell you whether something is running inside an Angular zone. So for example, this is an Angular zone. is just going to return a Boolean if you're in the zone or not. But if you want to throw an error, if something goes into the zone, you can, you can use this assert in Angular zone uh, function. Then next up, we have an R easy one, which is enable production mode. So by default, thank you, or does some checks for you in order to ensure that your data flows correctly and things like that. However, that has some, uh, some overhead to it. So what you should do is that when you run your production build, you should rem remember to enable production mode. It's super easy. You just have to import this function and say enable prod mode when you're in production. Uh, then another tip is that you shouldn't render elements that aren't necessary. So here I've got an example of a dropdown, which is a pretty typical use case. So you've got the, the button that shows the dropdown, and then you have the dropdown itself with a bunch of items. And that dropdown is probably display none or something like that. However, this is going to render all of these menu items uh, in the background. So what you can do instead when you're implementing your dropdown is that you can implement it as a template, which won't be rendered until you decide to render it. And this makes sense because you really don't need this until the user actually clicks on the button. Uh, afterwards, I have a couple of tips of how you can speed up your testing process. So these are some things that we discovered last year while working on Angular Material because we write a lot of unit tests, and then we run them on all the browsers that we support. But we hit a barrier at some point where I was just running out of memory because it didn't, wasn't able to run all of these tests. So for example, here's your typical material unit, unit test setup. So we've got a menu. And then in the before each, we just define a bunch of test components. So a simple menu, a position menu. And then we have 30 more use cases or something like that. And then we compile them. And then in each test, we just define one. Uh, we create one component. However, what this does is that it's going to recompile all of these 30-something components for every unit test, even though you're actually going to test one of the components. So what you can do instead 
is that you can take the before each and pull it out into a function uh, where you only pass the component that you're going to, to compile. So you pass in the component type, then you only declare the component, you compile it, and then you can return the fixture immediately. And what this does is that ensures that you only compile the components that you're going to need. So for example, this, d just doing this for one component ended up being the unit test for that component by something like 60%. So it can make you a lot more productive if you're doing test driven development. And then I've got another testing tip. So this is an example of what an async test usually looks like. So you create your component, then you toggle something, then you wait for the zone to stabilize, and then you do your assertions. But what this does is that it can cause your test to, be, to hang for a little bit before the zone stabilizes. And also what it ends up doing in IE and Edge is that it's just going to time out your test if the browser is minimized. So what you can do instead is instead of running it in the async zone, you can run it in the fake async zone instead, which makes everything async, which has an effect of making your test cleaner and they're also a lot faster. So this test can be refactored like this. So all you have to do is instead of wrapping it in the async function, you wrap it into the fake async function. Then instead of saying fixture when stable, you just flush out all the async, all the async tasks. And after that, the, the associates are exactly the same. And yeah, that's about it. You can, <laughs> you can find the slides on this link.